Hello, City FM. It may be midwinter, but we're in the mood for a barbecue. Atalanta and Lazio throw their beef on the grill. Juve are sizzling hot against Inter. And is Gattuso's time as Napoli manager overdone? We discuss all that, lap up the Genovese sunshine, and kick back with some civilized beers in this episode of Scudetto. Hello, welcome to Scudetto. You will notice we're without our uh, our compadre, uh, Oscar, who is unfortunately feeling a little bit under the weather this week. So you're stuck with Boaz and myself, Kenny, this week. Uh, but uh, other than that, no other changes. So still two good beers uh, and uh, two good Scudetto squad members. Uh, Boaz, how are you doing? I'm doing well this week. Great. What have you got to drink? I Unfortunately... Um... I placed a big beer order last week and none of those beers are, have arrived and we're still in a massive lockdown, so all the shops are closed. So I'm drinking a generic uh, henchman beer lager oh, type thing. Oh, right. Okay. I think I've done a bit of an Oscar there then. Oversold. Oversold in the two good beers. I mean, it's a decent beer. It's just, it's not, it's not remarkable. We're not, yeah, we're not off to a great start. You just wait till I get these 70 beers I ordered. Then, then these conversations, are every, every time you call me up, I'm going to have something interesting. The problem is that Oscar will be hosting by then. So uh, <laughs> doesn't really help me out much. I've got a Tempest Brewing Company uh, Long White Cloud New Zealand Extra Pale. It's called a New Zealand Extra Pale or an NZ Extra Pale. Maybe it's not New Zealand at all, uh, but it is actually from Scotland. Uh, it's quite nice. I've already had uh, some of it. And uh, yeah. Nice, nice and smooth. I think I might have ordered one of those. Good. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Uh, right, we've got loads, loads to get through uh, this week. We're going to try and uh, stick to Oscar's tight, tight ship that he's been running recently. Uh, we're going to start off with uh, Lazio, actually. Lazio, who have now won five in a row uh, off the back of their latest uh, victory in Bergamo against uh, Atalanta. We're going to start with the, the performance was... Uh, a few key players back, Luis Alberto and uh, Immobile back in the, the starting lineup for this one. Uh, what did you make of the game? Lazio were very, very impressive. And while I expected more from Atalanta, it felt like once again in a big match, Inzaghi's, Inzaghi got his tactics just right. And as you mentioned, Immobile and Luis Alberto were back. But in general, there is a feeling that uh, when Lazio field their starting eleven, they can beat pretty much anyone on their day. It's when you start dropping into the second or third lines that things get a little bit uh, messy. Yeah, and that obviously happened in the the Coppa Italia game, didn't it? Um, A a great game that that was, uh, which Atalanta came out um, on top, um, really. But uh, this one, for me, I I don't know about yourself, but I felt like Lazio seemed in complete control of this game. Uh, Atalanta weren't really able to to hurt them. They struggled to break down what was a great defensive, uh, well, defensive perhaps is underselling it, but um, really, really organized uh, Lazio defense. Uh, and then they were absolutely ruthless, ruthless on the break. Yeah, and uh, two stats that kind of back this idea up are the, the fact that uh, Gasperini seemed to switch his uh, tactics around halfway through. He took out a midfielder, threw on a defender, then he took out one of the defenders and put on a more attacking midfielder. So obviously changed shape. But also the fact that as soon as the, um, Atalanta got one goal back, Lazio went right down the other side and got a goal almost straight after. So um, they were keen to close the game off and they did it in the best way possible. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, a lot of questions to be asked, uh, particularly on that third goal of uh, Atalanta's defense as well. I know that... Uh, Romero was obviously missing from this game um, with, uh, well, he tested positive for, for COVID, but has made a very, very quick comeback and uh, also missing a, a couple of wing backs as well. I guess the same Romero thing. Romero was just it, excited for getting an honorable last week. So he, <laughs> yeah. he heard, he heard that Oscar was watching out for him specifically. So he uh, made his excuses. Um, but yeah, I guess the same thing goes for for Atalanta, as you say about Lazio. Questions about the the depth of the of the squad there. Um, yeah, I don't think any questions really. Um, I don't think anyone can really say that Lazio didn't didn't deserve this. But a, a particularly interesting uh, thing that happened after the game was the beef that uh, was very very obvious between uh, Gasperini and uh, Gasperini specifically, and uh, I think Lazio more more generally was. 
Yeah, I think this is uh, some of this is uh, leftovers from last year's Coppa Italia final, where Gasperini felt that uh, Atalanta deserved a penalty, and also um, he felt that perhaps Lazio and Lazio's management didn't act too magnanimously when with the win. This time round, Atalanta won, and I think they also in the cup. I mean, and I think they made a point of celebrating in their faces. And so, um, once the final whistle went, uh, Inzaghi and his team seemed to be celebrating like they just won the Champions League or something. And uh, as you said, the post-match quotes were very tasty. Gasperini had the the he said that uh, if I'm not mistaken, we often finish ahead of Lazio in the table. And uh, mm-hmm. to which one of the Lazio players responded. Uh, if Atalanta want to see the Coppa Italia, they can come and see it in our training ground right now. Yeah, well, and it seems to be one that all of the teams are uh, all of the teams that are still in it are actually putting their all into into uh, actually doing that this season. I think the Coppa Italia historically has perhaps not been regarded as highly as uh, as Serie A itself, but certainly uh, no signs that any teams kind of putting out their their second second string. Right, so we're gonna we're gonna move on shortly. It's uh, before we do that, Boaz. I think you you mentioned to me beforehand a particularly interesting transfer that Lazio have uh, have made. Yeah, I was um, interested to find out that uh, Lazio have recently signed uh, Romano Floriano Mussolini. Yes, the great grandson of uh, Benito himself, and uh, apparently he's a right wing um, back. And uh, yeah, it should be interesting. <laughs> Uh, okay, we're going to move on very, very quickly from that. Uh, won't fester too too long on that. Torino next up for Atalanta on uh, Saturday, uh, I believe, while Lazio host Cagliari on Sunday. We're going to move on to Napoli next. Uh, it's been a bit of a rocky road for, for Napoli over the last month or so. Uh, they had to dig deep on Wednesday night to grind out a, a nil-nil against Atalanta. There's been a lot of talk uh, before, uh, well, in, in the months kind of leading up to this, uh, of Gattuso signing an extension. Will he? Won't? Won't he? But now it appears that that might be unlikely. Boaz, what do you make of what's going on at Napoli? It seems a bit strange from the outside, um, particularly considering that Gattuso is one of the few managers who managed to bring some sort of silverware to Naples, and also. Um, if you look at the table, Napoli are in amongst those teams that are just a few points away from the Champions League spot and also a few points away from ending in no man's land. But uh, the season is far from over. And when Gattuso has had his uh, starting 11 available, and I'm talking especially about Osiman, Mertens and Insigne up mm. front, that's made a world of a difference. Right now he has some of these guys back, but it's clear that they're not 100%. Perhaps some of the criticism is a bit unfair. Having said that, um, the rumors in the Italian media, at least, is are that uh, De Laurentiis has already spoken to a few former managers, including uh, possibly even Sari, allegedly, although I find that hard to believe. So the the love affair between Naples and Gattuso is, will probably come to an end at the end of the season. And I think uh, that's slightly unfair given how the team plays. And if you look at their results, they've only drawn one game. I think they lost five or six games this season. At the end of the day, they're they're in or there or thereabouts. Yeah, and a lot could hinge as well on uh, the games against Juve um, coming up, you'd imagine. Very unsettling times. But I guess one ray of sunshine for them is that uh, Gattuso did say that Osiman is um, getting back to uh, a certain level in, in training. So... Perhaps, uh, yeah, perhaps things will kind of brighten up from there. I don't know. I, I, I believe Mertens is still in Belgium receiving receiving treatment. So um, not over the worst of it yet, I don't think. And uh, we're quite fond of quoting Gattuso here. He had a massive breakdown about De Laurentiis earlier in the week where he said that he felt disrespected and that uh, he's a company man. And if that company doesn't want him around, then they should just get rid of him. And then mm. in his uh, post-match interview after the Atalanta game, he said uh, a priest doesn't repeat the same sermon twice. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I, I'm happy to worship at the Church of Gattuso. Yeah, he is great for a quote. So it's actually going to be interesting for, for Napoli coming up next is inform Genoa a potential banana skin there, do we think? 
Napoli ultimately beat Parma in what was not a particularly exciting game. I'd say Genoa are a few steps above uh, Parma in terms of play and also the, since Baladini's taken uh, over. So uh, yeah, it could be a banana skin. Uh, and at the same time, I, I would say that Napoli will likely get a result here. Okay, so from one disgruntled manager, we're going to move on to another one. I feel quite bad for this because uh, Inter are doing so well. They're uh, two points off the top of uh, so yeah, really, by all accounts, not, not a bad season at all. But what started off as a good week for, for Inter with a, a convincing 4-0 win against Pippo Inzaghi's Benevento turned a little bit sour in uh, midweek with the, the Coppa Italia game against uh, against Juve they also have this ongoing uh, this ongoing financial situation which uh, appears to have thrown the tub the club into a, a bit of turmoil uh, there've long been reports that Inter were expecting an offer from BC partners for uh, at least a, a minority a minority stake it appears that that has actually materialized this week BC partners valuing uh, the club at 750 million euros, uh, including debt. Uh, Inter, uh, or Suning, I should say, uh, valuing Inter at closer to to 900 million, have already apparently turned down this offer and have issued a uh, basically uh, a plea for 200 million euros in emergency funding, which they put down to to the uh, the COVID fallout. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't look very uh, very encouraging. This is this uncertainty. Do you think beginning to translate onto the on field performances, Boaz? So it's it's hard to say in the year of the pandemic whether uh, anything on the pitch is uh, is actually an effect of something that's happening off the pitch. As an example, we were waxing lyrical about Atalanta beating Milan just last week, I believe, and uh, just a few weeks ago we were raving about uh, Inter's performance against Juventus. So it seems like this year more than any other year is uh, very cyclical and uh, a team that's on the up could be on the down. But as you mentioned earlier on, Inter are just two points off the off the top of the table. They have a formidable squad, possibly, arguably, a better squad than Milan, except in goal, you could say. And they have every chance of winning the Scudetto in the end as long as they don't shoot themselves in the foot. And uh, some of the quotes that have been coming out of the camp and some of the actions of the players have been, uh, don't, haven't helped, let's put it this way. Yeah, in particular, uh, Arturo Vidal, uh, well, and Conte himself, but um, Arturo Vidal, who apparently has escaped uh, any sort of fine for this, but the, the TV uh, microphones picked up his audio as as is always happening these days with no no fans in the stadium uh coming off the pitch saying uh, it's always number 22 always number 22 off uh so that i think coupled with conte's uh conte's com- comments that they were on a trajectory they were on a project and uh, the project froze in or the project is frozen as of august i mean th- that it does tend to point to some sort of disharmony there. Certainly, I mean, we've talked about Conte moaning all the quite often. Um, you've also you also spoke a month or two back about how disconcerting it was to have a happy Conte. Uh, what have we got at the moment? Have we got uh, happy campers all round, or doesn't sound like it really? No, it's uh, back to the norm for Conte. But at the same time, you have to wonder if is he trying to get fired? Is is uh. because his quotes definitely don't are not firing up the team. If you play football manager, you know that when you get asked a question from the press, you have five or six options, and there's always one that's a little bit more ridiculous than the other ones. And Conte always picks that one. He's like, <laughs> the project is over. Like, why say that? Just be like, you know, I'm going to speak to the ma- to the owners and decide. Like, it seems like he suffers from the, having to get everything off his chest after the games, and his h- hidden messages are not so hidden. Yeah. I mean, let's say that Suning aren't able to, to sell the club. Uh, let's assume that there is a period where there's just no money available. Would Conte even want to be at Inter under those circumstances? I think uh, Conte maybe is uh, is acting from the presumption that Suning just can't fire him at the moment. His 
contract of uh, allegedly 12 million euros a year is higher than any other manager in the league. And yeah. I guess that gives him um, a little bit more leeway to speak his mind. Uh, but as you said, if, if there is a significant uh, lack of investment in the team over a few transfer windows, maybe Conte will start thinking about uh, his next steps. At least this, this summer, the, the players that Conte wanted, the color of uh, Vidal, they arrived. Yeah. So I think yeah. he has very little excuses. And also they have a brand new signing in Christian Eriksen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, I quite fancy his chances of uh, breaking his way into that uh, Inter side. Young Danish lad. Yeah, it's, it's, who knows what he could do. Maybe take free <laughs> kicks. Maybe, maybe. Uh, the other side of that Coppa Italia tie, obviously, is uh, Juve. Pirlo said after this uh, after this game, uh, Pirlo said that the league meeting between the two, which I mean you mentioned there before, Boaz, um, which we're raving about Inter's performance afterwards. He said that that was an anomaly for for Juve. Uh, they learned a lot from that encounter at San Siro, um, and obviously things have uh, started looking up for them as well in the league with Inter and Milan both having dropped points a couple of weeks back. Um, are we starting to see them sort of stabilize or is this victory actually the opposite? Is it just more evidence of their inconsistency that they can be uh, so outplayed by Inter one, one week and then a couple of weeks go there and pick up a result like this? So first of all, I wanted to bring up a quote that uh, Pirlo gave when um, Juventus won the Super Cup against Napoli a week and a half ago. And he said that uh, winning a cup as a manager was felt way better than winning it one as a player. And I, I just need to remind listeners that this is a player who won a couple of Champions Leagues, a World Cup, and countless Scudettos. So I'm not really sure what he's talking about. You, you just won the Super Cup. But in any case... Um, <laughs> With all due respect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the the game against Inter is probably not indicative in the sense that both goals were uh, handed to them by Inter. One was um, a pretty silly penalty given away by Ashley Young. Uh, yeah, and the, the second was you. We've probably you might have seen it, but it was one of it's like worthy of those uh, blue YouTube uh, haha funny f- football videos uh, videos. Yeah. But basically. Uh, the defender and Andanovic got into all sorts of messes and uh, Cristiano Ronaldo was there to sweep up and stick the ball into an en- empty net. But I, fe- I felt that Inter actually played better in that game or at least ha- showed more attacking impetus than Juve did. Having said that, y- Juve are well known for grinding out results. I- I've said it over and over, we'd be fools to count them out of the race. Yeah, and a Gigi Buffon uh, wonder save really required to... To stop Inter from from drawing level as well, Gigi Buffon, who is um, once again in trouble for um, blasphemy, he um, <laughs> apparently he shouted some words that are illegal in Italy, and after Lautaro's goal, and so um, he might miss a game or two. Presumably, he would have sat those, uh, those games out uh, anyway. But there would be the cup games that he misses, right? By the Italian. Rules. Yeah, I think that's how it works. Yeah, the next game, I guess. Um, so it's going to be Fiorentina next for, for Inter, um, while Juve are going to be facing Roma on Saturday. Roma are going to be without Smalling, Pedro and Reynolds, uh, recently, recently acquired for this. Uh, but another old, uh, well, another new face slash old face, El Sharawi, uh, has apparently been training with Roma, could be in contention, but what are your, your immediate takeaway from this? Granted, I'm not a Romanista, but... For me, this transfer in particular is very lackluster. Um, the, in Italian, there's a saying of a uh, minestra riscaldata, reheated soup. But in this case, um, El Sharawi was shipped off to China with pretty much uh, not too much of a not too much uh, of a big deal was made of it. And now he's being brought back like it's an in- important signing. I suppose his style of play fits in well with um, uh, Fonseca's tactics and also. Perhaps he's uh, looking for a chance to be closer to the Azzurri so that he can be in contention for Euro 2020. Great. So we're going to move on to our the section that we introduced last week, I think, actually. Uh, good week, bad week, Buzz. Um, do you want to go with good week first? Yeah, let's do good first. Let's be positive. Who is your nomination for or your selection for good week? I'm going to pick Genoa for a good week. 
they um I mean it's more of a good month even but uh you have to say that uh ever since Baladini has taken over and we we were a little bit uh we called him the Italian Big Sam I think or or rather Oscar called him the Italian Big Sam <laughs> but uh in any case um the team is playing with much more of an identity uh they're winning games home and away and a few individuals are impressing which is more than you could say for pretty much the whole season last year Great. And yeah, I think that's 10 points out of uh, 12 in the league for, for Genoa. So absolutely no problem with that show uh, personally at all. Um, I'm going to go with Parma for bad week. Uh, and it's not necessarily for their... Well, I mean, it is. They, they lost 2-0 against a, a, a Napoli who are not obviously in the best condition. I think Gattuso said that everyone's absolutely dead on their feet at the moment and he doesn't have anyone fit to, to pick from but no shame really in losing to, to Napoli they are a, a higher caliber of team than Parma are. but I'm I, I mean it, it's got to go to Kyle Krauss really this one uh who got himself into he got himself into a Twitter spat with um yeah with what could only be classified as royalty of uh Italian and international footballing media uh, Gabriele Marcotti who was calling into question uh, the signings. I think in particular, um, I mean, we'll come on to the signings in a moment, but in particular, the, the choice of attacking signings. And uh, Marcotti had actually quoted another uh, another journalist who had said it was uh, an interesting move. And get Marcotti said, yes, I mean, here's a team that plays counter-attacking football and you signed two target men. What are you playing at? Uh, to which Carl Cross replied, I think the original quote was actually positive, but... Gabriele Marcotti, I'm not sure, I'm not sure yours is or something along those lines. So it's been a difficult week to pick a bad week, really, because uh, a lot of the teams that lost, uh, particularly those that lost heavily, uh, I think, were were against teams you'd expect them to. But that, they're my nomination for for bad week. I mean, I think there's a couple of other teams that could be in with a shout, but um, at the moment, at least, uh, the the teams I'm thinking of are the ones at the very bottom of the table. Let's say that they're, they're they're not. They're not surprising us by being there. So I think Parma, particularly when they were bought over, there was a lot of excitement and it's just not translated on the pitch yet. Yeah, fair comment. Uh, right, so just before we move on to, we're going to do a bit of a transfer roundup in a little bit, but before we move on to that, uh, we're going to do best of the rest from the week. Milan, the league leaders, took two penalties to get past Bologna. Uh, Zlatan, who missed the first one, another missed penalty, for Zlatan with uh, Rebic putting in the, the rebound and Kessie taking control of uh, of affairs for, for the next one. Bologna also got a goal back. Uh, final score in that one was 2-1 and it's going to be Crotone at San Siro on Sunday next up for, for Milan. Cagliari and Sassuolo, uh, they drew 1-1. Uh, you mentioned them there, Boaz. Uh, Jeremy Boga turning in a 94th minute equalizer at the back post uh, and uh, Rodrigo de Paul penalty enough to see Udinese take all three points against Spezia looking forward to next weekend it's uh, Emilia Romagna derby uh, with Parma hosting Bologna so that'll be another one to that's the derby the derby with the best food in my opinion oh yeah absolutely absolutely Uh, right so transfers what have we got Boaz we have got so I'm going to start us off with uh, Rugani to uh, from Ren to Cagliari on loan uh, and free agent Asamoa also uh, joining the the Sardinians. But those those deals to Parma boys the ins the ins and outs or rather the ins uh, at Parma. Parma signed uh, wonder kid Zirki from Bayern Munich on loan as well as Gaziano Pere who uh, ended his experience in China. As Marcotti mentioned, both strikers are six foot four, both a target man. One is a player towards the end of his career, or at least in, to, in the twilight of his career, let's say. The other is a promising striker. I'm not really sure how they play together, if they play together, what the deal is. And um, But at the same time, I, I would be quite excited about that. I think it gives them a, a little bit of something different. Um, up until now, all they had was Bobby English up front. <laughs> Right, okay. And uh, just to round off the, the transfers, we're going to highlight that Sami Khedira has joined Hertha Berlin from 
from Juve bringing to an end his, his spell in Turin. Uh, another thing to mention that Boaz actually you you brought up to me was that all Serie A clubs have collectively spent 80% less on transfer fees in this winter transfer window than last year. So perhaps a sign of of the times. Right. So ask Scudetto. It's the first Ask Scudetto of uh, of the year, is it? Or yes, I believe it is. Uh, it so is. we're going to be doing the, this. The last one was for the Christmas special, I believe. Right. Yeah. So we're going to be doing this for the first podcast of every episode from from now on, and we're going to start off this week. Every month. With, sorry, every month. Yes, we're going to start off this this week. We're going to start off with questions from Viola Club Israel. Uh, the, uh, there are quite a few questions in here. We're going to we're going to pick just a couple of them really um boaz destro yay or nay i have him i was going to mention him later in any case so we'll we'll come to him okay thoughts on jaco stripped from captaincy the captaincy stripped from him last week our, our pod was quite heavily focused on th- this uh, mythological switch between sanchez and zeko in the end both clubs decided that financially it made no sense particularly for roma as they noticed that they would have to pay um Sanchez's salary that and there was a lot of extra fees involved. In any case, um, I think in the lot, Zeko has now been included in the in the European squad for the U- the Europa League, and I think uh, while he's been stripped of his captaincy, and that probably makes sense. And in any case, particularly in Rome, it makes sense to have a Roman captain. But um, I think he'll be a useful player. And let's let's face it, uh, this might kind of rile the traditionalists, but the captaincy role is. Pretty much symbolic nowadays, anyways. Controversial. Um, okay, moving on to one from Paul here. Why do so many expensive midfielders flop at Inter in recent years? Off the top of my head, Eriksen, Nangolan, Benega, Joao Mario, Condogbia, and Guarin. Uh, shall I take that? Yeah, yeah, you take it. I'm hosting this time. I've got an easy ride. It's it's all on you. <laughs> so um, I think the I mean, let me look at the list of players. I think in some of those cases, they are all are all have their own little narratives, and also Inter have gone through three or four different owners in the past decade or so. Yeah. So I think all of these fall under different ownerships. But um, Ericsson was bought despite uh, Conte not really needing him or wanting him. Nyangolan uh, was a was bought as well, kind of in the same way. And I don't think Conte ever really believed in him. Banega, I don't really remember. Joao Mario didn't really do it at West Ham either. So, he, I mean, they spent a lot of money on him, but probably wasn't worth it. Uh, Congo Congo Bia was supposed to be the next Paul Pogba, and they even had a chant that was, um, "We ha- you have Pogba, we have Congo Bia. Uh, uh, but it didn't quite work out. Uh, but I think also that was partly because of the expectation on his shoulders. And I mean, Freddy Guarin was they bought. I think they bought for pretty cheap overall. And there, w- there was a whole saga with him, um, with him going to Juve, and in the end, he he ended up uh, moving abroad. And uh, it's worth noting that uh, if if you see pictures of Freddy Guarin now, it feels like he um, he had a twin and ate him. <laughs> but but <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. So yeah, yeah, that's yeah. That, that's me about the Inter. I don't think there is basically in short. I don't think there's an overall pattern. I think these are all different cases, and uh, while a lot of midfielders didn't work, a, a, they have a lot of fantastic midfielders that have worked. For yeah, them. Barella, the name one that springs to mind at the moment, one of the hottest prospects in Italian football. Lovely player. Yeah, uh, Boaz, you you mentioned the Condogbia chant there. That brings us nicely on. To the, a question from Dom, which is, what was the best chant you heard live in Italy? So, I mean, Italy is probably not as well known for brainy chants and uh, off-the-cuff ideas. There, There is a great uh, tifo in the sense that a lot of people singing the same thing together creates a great atmosphere and an amazing energy. But the chants are, more, are a little bit more direct, a little bit less uh, cutting, let's say. Having said that, I mean, I, I'm always tickled to tell the story of um it was in the 90s and Marcel Desailly was playing a blinder and the whole state the whole San Siro which at the time was about 80,000 people was chanting Marcel Desailly Marcel Desailly except one man that was my father to my left who <laughs> who, who decided it was Forza Desailly Forza Desailly and like everyone anyone sitting around us was like turning around looking at him a bit strangely so 
I'll, I'll always cherish this memory. Yeah, awkward, awkward moment with the, everyone in the stadium knowing the words to to words. It's words not that hard to remember as well. You know, it's two <laughs> <Exactly>. words. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, right, so last Ask Scudetto question of this month. Uh, it comes from Mike, and it's, why won't Kenny follow me on Twitter? I'm his number one fan, and I'm always defending him against his critics on the fans of Scudetto Pod WhatsApp group. I didn't know there was a WhatsApp group. I didn't I didn't know there is, but um, yes, in light of that, um, and regardless of that, um, it's, a, it's an oversight on my point. Uh, on my side, Mike, and I will uh, definitely, definitely be following you probably before this before this episode actually goes out uh, on Friday. Right. So, with that in mind, uh, we're going to move on to honourable and dishonourable mentions. Uh, Boaz, starting with you, uh, you have got one for Denis Godeas. Yes, um, Denis Godeas announced his retirement this week, aged forty-five, and. Um, Apart from that, he's one of the, he's another one of these uh, mythological names in the Serie A landscape. But um, in October, he achieved the rare feat of, of having scored one or more goals in Serie A, Serie B, Serie C1, Serie C2, Lega Pro, Serie D, Eccellenza, Promozione, Prima Categoria, Seconda Categoria, Terza Categoria. Basically, God forgives, God, God ass doesn't. Great. Uh, I've got an honourable mention for Elmas, uh, and this is for uh, Napoli's second goal uh, against Parma. Uh, th- there are accusations of the, the defence being a bit, little bit powder puff on this, which I guess I tend to tend to agree with. But uh, just some really, really incredible footwork and, and balance for, for that goal. I definitely recommend checking it out uh, on, on YouTube if you get a chance. Uh, there's that famous image of uh, Maradona, I think it's Belgium, that Argentina were playing against, where he's surrounded by about seven players. And one of the camera angles actually almost looks like that. Um, and Elmas just kind of, yeah, it's just really, really great co- close control uh, and a lovely finish as well, very cyn- uh, clinical finish to, to end it off with. Uh, right, Boaz, Destro, why? First of all, and it's this seems. I think this is the first pod where I don't have a dishonorable mention. I'm only giving out flowers, so I, it's a new, February is a nice boys time. But um, back in our very first episode of this season, I gave an honorable mention to Desto for scoring a really fast goal, and that, that was his first goal in Serie A for well over a year. Uh, and we kind of asked ourselves, is this form going to continue? What's going to happen? Well, Desto is continued to bang the goals in. I think he has eight so far this season. And um, he's part of the reason why um, Genoa have climbed up the table. And uh, I think Ballardini is getting the best out of him. And honestly, it's it's great to see a player who, at the time when he signed for Roma especially, was seen as one of Italy's great hopes. And obviously, it didn't quite work out for him. But he, he seems like a nice chap. And uh, it's good to see. Right, so you don't have a dishonorable this week for the first time, but I've I've definitely got a dishonorable. All right, uh, and mine is going straight to Milenkovic uh, for Fiorentina's one-one draw with with Torino. So basically, Fiorentina went down to to ten men. I think it was about twenty twenty-five minutes. Castrovilli um, was sent off for for a last man foul, uh, despite being down to ten men. Fiorentina managed to put together a really lovely, lovely, well-worked team goal, which Ribéry finished off. Uh, so Fiorentina had about 20 minutes to to cling on with 10 men to to a one 0 lead, and uh, Milenkovic basically managed to get himself suckered into a situation with Belotti, where I think the two were scrapping over by the by the corner flag. Um, referee blew up. Belotti was a little bit riled, stood up and kind of leaned forward towards Milenkovic like, with his head. Milenkovic just absolutely bought it, hook, line and sinker. L- I mean, leaned at the very least his head into uh, into Belotti, but just gave the referee absolutely no option but to send him off, thus reducing Fiorentina down to nine men to play the last uh, 20 or so minutes and uh, Fiorentina ultimately conceding a goal in the 88th minute and uh, those two points could have been very useful to them. So just like really, really schoolboy stuff. Um, terrible. And I never understand why players do that uh, Billy Goat thing. I, it's it's not effective. It's, no, I know. Even if you really wanted to cause someone damage, you wouldn't do that. And if you just want to be posture, don't do that. It's the worst thing yeah. and it's something you only see in football. Agree. 
stupid, absolutely stupid. Uh, and just very finally, uh, an honorable mention from me as well for Cuadrado. He's been back uh, after being out with COVID-19. He's been back for four games. In each of those games, he has provided an assist. In each of those games, uh, Juve have have won. So four games back since COVID, four assists, four wins. Uh, honorable mention for Cuadrado for me. Uh, that is actually, that's that's all we've got time for this week. Uh, so please do, as ever, uh, subscribe to Scudetto on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your audio. And do follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Scudetto Pod. Until next time, enjoy the football. La Roma è campione d'Italia per la stagione 2000-2001. Il titolo del 2008.